Thank you, graduating class of 2017, for inviting me here to speak today. Thank you to the University of Colorado, to the Chancellor, to the President, and to the Board of Regents for supporting their decision. Congratulations, distinguished faculty, friends and family, and of course, especially to the graduates. That's right. But I'll be honest, this is the coolest and the scariest thing I have ever done. All right, so I'm comforted here by two things. One, I have absolutely no memory of my commencement speaker. And two, two, no memory. I guess at least I'm not Betsy DeVos right now, so that's right. That's my play here today, is to set the bar very, very low. I actually solicited opinions about this speech from many people, including my parents, who are here today. Okay, the advice was wide-ranging. Just be funny, mention politics, don't mention politics. A few folks even suggested, I should note the current work of the schools here at CU, showing I'm in touch with the university. I agree that this would have been wildly impressive of me, but, Another piece of advice was to be myself, so I'm going to be transparent right now. I boarded the plane to Colorado using my passport because I lost my driver's license, all right? <laughs> the only form of payment I have right now is my girlfriend's credit card because I lost my wallet. It's in Ithaca at Cornell being mailed back to me right now. My car is 8,000 miles past due on its oil change and I filed an extension on my taxes. So, <laughs> right? The likelihood that I am up to date on the university's research papers and grants, I'm not. Okay. My parents are likely nodding because they're probably still wondering when I'm going to follow through on what I promised them 14 years ago when I graduated, to take myself off the family cell phone plan. <laughs> no? It's too convenient, guys. All right, so I'm obviously not here today to tell you how to be like a competent, functioning adult, but I am, however, going to be earnest about a few things that have been spinning around my mind lately. I grew up playing basketball. Eventually, I played here at the University of Colorado. That's right. But first, I practiced every day for almost a decade. I spent afternoons and evenings working on my game in a gym empty of everything except my dad, a basketball, and me. Okay, so during those years, I took 250 shots a day, which means that growing up, I took one million shots. And that was one million shots that no one witnessed and no one applauded. Okay, and yet I remember the undiluted sense of accomplishment when I watched the ball arc toward the rim and when I watched it drop through the net. Okay, the gratification came from feeling the competence of my own body which I had harnessed through repetition. Hearing the snap of the net was the end of the feedback loop. It had ended by the time the ball hit the floor. Perhaps you guys are worried right now that this is a story meant to emphasize the value of working hard when no one is watching. It's not. This is a story about validation and about satisfaction, about where we find these things and what happens when we start looking in the wrong places? Because a shift has occurred. We're now addicted to the reaction and to the applause. Okay, it's even more than that. It's almost as if nothing is inherently beautiful unless enough people agree that it is. Writing this speech was revelatory for me. Because for three months, I floundered writing speech after speech. Seven total. They're all on my Mac. Well, actually, some of them are on my girlfriend's Mac, which I left in the back pocket of a plane. But Delta assures me that they are working diligently to find that Mac. Not a competent functioning adult. So the reason I struggled was because buzzing in my subconscious was the hope that if I wrote the perfect speech, it would go viral on Twitter and Facebook, and maybe even a publisher would turn it into one of like those little books in which the very best commencement speeches are preserved. So you guys see the problem immediately. I was writing to the response. In none of those earlier versions did I attempt to capture what be, might be most useful to you 
but instead I focused on what might get the most clicks if put later on the internet. So after all my fits and starts on this speech, I asked myself, for whom am I writing this? Was it option A for me, so I can be clever and insightful? Was it option B for you guys, so that maybe you might remember something I say here today, or might even forget it until later when you saw and felt that thing for yourself? Perhaps actually it's option C for both of us. No new ideas exist, just new ways of presenting them, new ways of illuminating them, reminding ourselves what we know is real, but often forget as we're drowning in this pool of superficiality. So how about this? How about screw perfection, the little table book, and what happens after the ball hits the floor? Because 14 years have passed since I sat where you're now sitting, and the truth is, there is very little I've learned that I feel comfortable standing here and telling you is unequivocally true. But there are a few things, there are a few things I think you should consider. It wasn't the end of the speech, guys. We got more. <laughs> Here's one. Dust settles on people, too. All right, we accumulate layers without even realizing it. And these layers are the perceptions and beliefs of others. Sometimes it's your professors and your parents. Sometimes it's someone you've never even met, but you just see and hear them. And this dust weighs on us. It muddles our decisions in ways almost impossible to recognize. Right now, as you sit here, you guys might be coded in these layers. You might be headed toward a job or a master's degree that was chosen using the rubric of someone else's values. But truth is, even now as I stand here, I know my recent decisions have been clouded by this accumulation of what I should do, not what I want to do. So I should want to be on TV. I should want to make more money. Underneath those layers, I know a different truth. I know I want to be writing more even if it means I'll make less money. Try replacing your should with your want, and as frequently as you're able, make decisions with that rubric. Because life is best when your should and your want are aligned. And when they're divergent, ask yourself, for whom and what purpose are you doing this thing you believe you should? But, like, don't misinterpret the point. I can maybe see the parents out here like, worried that your kids are going to do just whatever they want all the time. Because we often, and you guys know this, you often have to do things you don't want to do. You have to go to funerals. You have to pay dues at your first few jobs. You have to, fi you have to file your taxes and like change the oil on your car. Sometimes. Sometimes it gets past due, but that's okay. Seriously though, you guys check in with yourself frequently to make sure you're waking up for your actual life. And not just because you're addicted to the side effects, that would be the money or the social status that it provides. It's not easy. I'm not even good at it. I'm just suggesting to be aware. Because this is a conversation I have often with myself about working at ESPN. Most people usually have a simpler question. They want to know how I got there. I tell them I got to ESPN by not trying to get to ESPN. The year after I graduated from CU, I was freelancing for the Boulder Daily Camera. I desperately wanted a job for that paper. It's a great paper. One afternoon, I asked one of their sports columnists, Neil Wolk, who now writes for CUBuffs.com. All right, shout out for Neil. Yeah. So I asked him for advice. I said, how long should I wait for a job at this paper? And he said, not a minute longer. At first, this advice disappointed me. It scared me. Because I really liked having a specific goal. It was comforting. That's how the world works when we're growing up. It's like we're climbing a ladder. And while climbing the ladder can be challenging and tiring, we're never worried that we're expending energy in the wrong direction. We study, we practice, we take our SATs, we apply to schools. 
So much of growing up is paint by numbers. And now, before most of you, the world is like a tree with branches and then branches off the branches. And how do you know which direction will take you where you want to go? And which might be a dead end? That day inside the camera, Neil Woke asked me what my goal was. I told him I wanted to write for their paper. And he asked me, did I want to write for their paper or did I want to write? I said immediately, I want to write. And two weeks later, I started a job at this tiny paper called The Daily Record in Eastern Washington State in a small rodeo town called Ellensburg. All right, Ellensburg. Shout out Eastern Washington. All right, here's the point. The dead ends I've hit are when I'm more worried about the headline than the content. I mean that literally and figuratively. The stories I've struggled the most with are the ones I've tried to tailor to a clever headline. The times that I've boxed in success and I've defined it as something specific, I've always felt a sense of disappointment when it didn't turn out exactly like I'd planned. So in journalism, one thing you learn quickly is to never ask yes or no questions. I guess sometimes we say talk about, and that never goes well either, but you always want to ask open-ended questions. You want to present them with a wide swath of space so that they can carve their own path within it. So consider making your goals the equivalent of open-ended questions so that dozens of those branches Dozens of those paths will lead to success. Now you guys, all this might sound like a fancy way of employing the cliche. Like focus on the journey, not the destination. And in some ways it is because cliches are true. But in one specific way right now, it's different. Because technology is quickly shifting how we view things, including success. At first, as I mentioned, I wrote a speech tailored to be shareable. This thinking did not materialize by chance in a vacuum. I thought this way because this is how we now think. We have hacked the human mind and we've discovered what types of headlines and what types of content us humans will be unable to resist. Our online world is like Las Vegas, it's designed for addiction. And one, and, and here's the point here, more and more we are creating stories to elicit reactions from people instead of mining ideas to reflect our world. So it's for this reason that I started with the story of the empty gym and the jump shot, because the paradigm of value and success has shifted. We're being taught to happen what, to know what happens after the ball hits the floor and to then tailor our shot to maximize the response. So when I first started at ESPN, my editor refused to share page view numbers with me. No matter how many times I asked her, she would say, I don't want you choosing stories based on page views. All right, now, I'm not just worried about stories. I even know exactly which Instagram photos will get the most likes. Okay, it's the ones when I include Nike sneakers in them, just so you guys know. I routinely construct situations to get my sneakers in pictures. In fact, if one of you guys want to take a picture, like at some point during the speech, I'll put it up on Instagram later. But, ser but I had this crude algorithm in my head. And now I'm not just chasing page views on stories. I'm altering the story of my life to chase page views. Okay, this is the buzzing superficiality that is hijacking our minds. It's steadily distracting us from sitting still and thinking, letting our mind connect ideas, seeing what meaningful thoughts come up in the silence. This is not a trivial matter. Like this is actually the fundamental process of making art, is sitting in silence and seeing what bubbles to the surface. Working to notice the world is being replaced by trying to be noticed by the world. And please, class of 2017, don't let this keep happening. Because noticing the world like, helps us make sense of it. Because what each of you notice about the world is different than what I notice about the world, than what your best friend, than what anyone else will notice about the world. And I might communicate through words, 
Some of you all might through numbers or design or engineering. But it all starts with a vibration of insight that we have to allow ourselves to recognize. It's like noticing and naming. That's your voice. So you guys, keep using it. Keep exercising it. You know, no matter how many people cheer after the ball hits the floor. Good luck to you guys, class of 2017. I'm rooting for you.